So hello, let me introduce myself. I am David Lacey. I'm the uh, Director of Library Technology at Temple University in Philadelphia, uh, presenting today with Cody Hansen from the University of Minnesota. Uh, and we will be speaking on, um, the title of our talk is Collecting, Correlating, Stitching, Enriching, How Commercial Publishers Are Creating Value by Profiling Users. Didn't work. So, how'd you do, how'd you do that? I clicked. Um, try it right here. Try it again now. Good. All, All right. right. Part one. <laughs> the patron data fire hose. Um, but more specifically, our institutional single sign-on systems. Um, I mentioned in the abstract uh, some specific technologies that, that, that facilitate this, this, this practice. And um, because of recent events, I was of forced to embellish my talk and, and, and cut some things out. This is going to be one of them. But essentially, if you're not familiar with how this practice works, um, the, the single sign-on essentially acts as a, a, a bridge between you, uh, an identity provider and a service to facilitate authentication and authorization um, in a manner that does not involve uh, passing credentials around. Um, the, 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 the authentication is governed by this notion of trust. You establish a relationship between the identity provider and the service provider, um, and then you, treat a, you agree to trust each other. Um, it's, it's further simplified by the introduction of trust federations, where instead of setting up this trust on a case-by-case -case basis, um, you can join a federation, and everyone agrees to trust everybody. So that's my 30-second review of how that works. Um, authorization, though. Um, is, is the part of the process that, that governs what, what an individual is allowed to do once they are on, on, a, on a service platform. Um, and there's a metadata profile that accompanies this transaction that, that, that contains data that defines who the patron is and what they are allowed to do. And it's the, the nuances of authorization uh, where things start to get weird. Um, this metadata profile often con contains names, which are useful to uh, consuming applications for personalization. Um, your email address, which is oftentimes used as an identifier, and in cases, at least within my institution, according to our uh, identity management director, uh, having the email is, is quite useful. In, in, you know, in, in the example that he gave me was how, dealing with our corporate license for, um, for, for Microsoft. Um, if a particular patron is having trouble, Installing the application uh, on the cloud, um, they, they, they can then work with the individual uh, directly without getting involved with uh, corporate IT. Um, and then also included in the, the, the metadata could be your institutional affiliation, whether you're a student, uh, faculty, or staff, alumni, et cetera. Um, so th this whole notion of using uh, single sign-on technologies in, 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 in the context of online publishing and commercial publishing was introduced to me at a, an RA21 meeting about a year ago. Um, RA21 is, a, is an initiative, uh, a NISO-led initiative to improve the user experience of patrons accessing um, uh, uh, online resources. And the group is largely comprised of STEM publishers. There, there's some exceptions to that, but it's mostly publishers and is led by NISO. Uh, more information on this group and who they are is going to be at the end of the talk uh, in, in the links. Um, and one of the recommendations within this program is to uh, leverage the single sign-on technology uh, uh, to, to access these resources in, in, in replace of the existing, um, uh, impl or the existing practice of using IP-based authorization, uh, which is through our easy proxy systems. Um, and my immediate takeaway not even the takeaway, like within 10 minutes of this meeting, um, it, it became clear to me that um, if, we're, if we're gonna go down this road of implementing you know, this level of trust with commercial vendors, we're gonna need to, uh, it's gonna require a substantial amount of discussion and planning to define enforceable policies. Um, but since this initial meeting, they've con uh, completed a pilot. It was uh, completed last fall. Again, there'll be a link at the end of the talk um, where they tested their new UI and they established an SSO integration with Elsevier. Um, 
In the pilot, the vendor, Elsevier, negotiated the transfer of patron information in the form of first name, last name, and email, but they also indicated that other fields would soon be required for departmental billing, differentiating between employee types, and for granular usage, of, usage reporting. Um, so it's more than just people's names. Um, and lo and behold, it, it all worked. It was a great success. But of course it did because these things work. We use them all the time. Um, so more important than privacy, or not more important, but privacy is obvious. We all see that. Let's talk about money, right? So privacy is a concern. Money is also a concern because data is money. Um, sorry. Let me get my notes. Um, you know, data is this gold standard, right? Um, and user profiles and usage patterns are responsible for an explosive financial growth within technology companies. I'm not going to name names. We all know who they are. <laughs> How much money, right? Like that. This is this is the hard question. Like, what 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 is this data worth? And analysis of existing research states that data is not worth much at all. Um, at least in its it, it isolated in 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 the smallest bits, it's not really worth much. But it's 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 its, its value can increase through a variety of factors. Um, the nature of the data, what kind of data are we talking about? Like data involving healthcare at, at, at the personal level is extremely ex valuable, which is frightening. Um, and when the data is aggregated and enriched with other bits of data, it goes up. Um, you know, in our, like think of our use case, having somebody's name and their email address isn't necessarily a big deal, but when you look at their names and email addresses, um, and then combined with what their browsing history is, it gets a little bit more complicated. Cody will go into some other examples later that um, get a lot more complicated. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's impossible to determine this number. A lot of like what governs the value of this data is protected by trade secrets. Um, but interestingly, the data's value can be inferred um, by how valuable the vendor perceives it to be. So historically, in order to get your hands on delicious data, you have to do some things. Um, you know, the, the, the free or discounted access to online services. So think of things like uh, airport Wi-Fi or, or, or Gmail. Um, the free or discounted access to online content. Think Spotify and Netflix. And the free or discounted uh, uh, offline services. Um, this one is really popular with uh, insurance companies, health trackers. Has anyone ever plugged in a little box to their car that you know tested how how good of a driver they are? I did that. Uh, not I, whatever. I, it was complicated. Um, <laughs> so recent events. I, I cut some things short. Um, a lot of things have happened in the past two months that that, that we really need to talk about because it relates specifically to this. Um, first of all, NISO's evolving narrative. Um, you know my early criticisms of RA twenty one. Um, were, were I, I think, misapplied, and I, I've definitely softened that. RA21 is just a group trying to figure out a way to do this. Um, you know, especially from the NISO perspective, they're, they're in a difficult position because they're playing both sides. Um, you know, they, they understand that there's this privacy concerns that, that, that the community is really passionate about, but at the same time, most of the people that are involved in the pilot and the project are corporate publishers who really want all this stuff. Um, but recently, they, they've established a, a, a um, uh, uh, what's the term, uh, code of conduct, uh, Jayant, I believe it's, it's pronounced. And what Jayant essentially establishes is that if, if there is going to be an exchange of patron metadata between a, an institution and a publisher, it has to be con contractually gr agreed upon. And any other data that may or accompany that, 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 that SSO transaction has to be discarded. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, Recent development number two, Safari Books Online. We recently re uh, negotiated our contract where we had two options, two. Option number one, use the fancy new system that uh, allows you to do um, offline reading. In exchange for using that platform, you have to use your SSO. No other way about it. Or we can continue to use the janky old platform use that uses IP-based authorization. So this is a great business model. You know, in exchange for having a better platform, we had to give them more data than they probably need. Um, we were unprepared to handle this negotiation. Um, recent event number three, Stanford's uh, recent uh, privacy statement and subsequent uh, scholarly kitchen article 
pretty much stating that, yeah, we're not doing any of this. Um, using SSO for, for uh, online databases is uh, you know, something that we're not even going to entertain. Um, and fourth on the list is, and, and I think they're, they're presenting now, is the, the, the Spark group recently declassified their, um, uh, their landscape analysis that is essentially uh, detailing the, the evolution of commercial publishers from being publishers to being data analytic firms. Um, and it's this last one, I, I think, that, that, that has really, not really shifted my thinking, but it's giving me more things to think about. Um, because now we're talking about a tale of two businesses. When this whole thing landed, I was thinking about how, what is the outcome going to be when commercial publishers can embellish their existing product line with new data? And I, in my, my, in my um, darkest hours of paranoia, um, I was thinking about you know, what, what impact it could potentially have on, on, on tiered pricing models, right? Everything now is strictly anonymous. How will, how will pricing models change when they know it's a student or a faculty member or, 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 or whatnot? But now, given that you know, you know, the advances made within Elsevier and people doing massive analysis on their corpuses that they maintain, what is the impact of this new data going to have from the perspective of a business analytic firm? Again, we mentioned earlier that the value of data tends to increase when you can associate it with other data. Um, and now we have a lot more data. Um, so just to recap. Um, so all of these technologies that, that implement this kind of communication are complicated, and they vary from institution to institution. I highly recommend everyone educate yourselves. I've been spending a lot of time with our director of identity management, and um, I wish I had some very fun, like uh, uplifting things to report. Um, implementing these SSO, SSO technologies with per, uh, commercial publishers raises privacy com concerns, pretty obvious ones. You know, we hold browsing history to be fairly sacred. And now we're looking at a landscape where other people will have to maintain that same sacred trust. Um, implementing SSO technologies with publishers slash data analytic businesses represents a new line of revenue and one that avoids established practices regarding its value. They're circumventing common convention that there's a trade-off in gathering this kind of data. They're not offering a cheap alternative platform to consume published goods. It's just, it's, it's, it's a gift-wrapped bonus. But in a lot of ways, it's sort of convenient because it, it, it helps, it, it sets it so that we can avoid having a very uncomfortable conversation about the fact that it is value and whether we hold or create leverage on that value. God forbid, think about selling it. But it is valuable and it's, the, the assumption that we'll just give it away avoids that conversation. But ultimately, all of these concerns fall squarely on the backs of the identity providers, AKA the institutions, the people that choose to pass through the information to vendors. Um, and that kind of relates back to point number one in education and figuring out what we're currently giving people as we, uh, how things are currently configured. Um, here's some helpful links. Um, there's Stanford's statement on patron privacy, the Jayant announcement, R21 pilot and the Spark landscape analysis. Um, thank you. This has been helpful. Uh, we're going to try to have time for questions at the at the end. Thank you. All right. Thanks, David. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, really happy to be here to talk a little bit about some work that uh, I've been doing over the past few months that came directly out of some. Uh, talks that I saw at the December CNI meeting and out of subsequent conversations uh, with David, among, among others. Um, so I'm going to talk about user tracking on academic publisher platforms. Um, before I, I go too far, I just want to acknowledge um, a lot of colleagues who have helped uh, sharpen my work here over the past couple of months, um, either through conversations, editing, or through their own uh, work in, in similar areas. I also want to tell you that I have a lot that I'm going to try to get through here in a short time, and I do want to have time for questions. So if you want to, he to read a lot more about what, uh, what I'm talking about here, I've got something online here. I'll put this link at the end of the talk as well. Um, I'll also put the slides there, and uh, this talk is being recorded, so it will be available on the CNI site. Um, I'll also put it on, on my site here as well. So 
Uh, I could go into great detail and left my own devices, I would. Um, so lest we run out of time, I want to give you the highlights, the key findings here up front. And I know, I apologize for those of you in the back, the type is small here. So uh, I'm going to give you a, a short rundown here. Um, I found uh, that the articles most frequently used by patrons at the University of Minnesota include code on their publisher pages that is designed to identify users and to link their identity to the pages that they visit. Uh, I found that these tools derive user identity in part through metadata that is not currently governed by our typical definition of personally identifiable information. And uh, the conclusion that I have come to is that I do not believe that it is currently possible to ensure that use of electronic library resources can be private. Uh, so I'll talk you through that now. <laughs> A little bit of background. So I mentioned the, the December CNI meeting. Uh, there were three talks there that were uh, really impactful for me in, uh, in, in this work. Uh, the first was um, a talk from Kenning Arlich and Scott Young, um, where uh, based on an article that they had written uh, with some colleagues, where they did some automated analysis of library homepage source code, uh, looking for the presence and proper implementation of privacy protection measures. Um, the second was a talk by Micah Altman, uh, Lisa Janicki Hinchliffe, and uh, Katie Zimmerman, um, uh, where they did a very detailed analysis of publisher platform terms of service and also uh, looked at some web tracking mechanisms. Um, and the third uh, was a talk by Todd Carpenter from NISO, Gene Shipman of Elsevier, and Ralph Youngen from ACS about RA21. Um, and there was a, a, a moment in that talk that really crystallized this project for me. And that was um, when, in response to questions from a bunch of dudes um, about, uh, about privacy and RA21, um, Todd Carpenter, in an attempt to reassure us that RA21 was not, in fact, a grab for personally identifiable information, said, and this is a paraphrase, publishers don't need RA21 to identify users. This was intended to, to allay our concerns. Um, I left the room concerned. Um, so here's what I did when I got home to Minneapolis. Um, in January and February of this year, um, I embarked on a, a very simple study trying to answer the question, can an analysis of the source code of publisher platform pages, much like the folks at Montana State did, um, provide evidence of if and how publishers can identify library users? to prove uh, if, if uh, Todd's, Todd Carpenter's statement was, was in fact true? The answer is yes. Um, and here's how I, how I went about this. I looked at the 100 most frequently accessed articles at the University of Minnesota. So we record DOIs that pass through our easy proxy server and have for a couple of years. And so I took the 100 DOIs that appeared most frequently in our easy proxy logs over a couple of years. Um, and uh, those 100 articles came from 15 different publisher platforms. Um, as an aside, I think the fact that there were only 15 platforms represented in the 100 most frequently used articles at our library is its own problem that is probably worth uh, further conversation, but I don't have time today. Um, for those 15 platforms, I took one representative article, the most frequently accessed article from that platform in our, in our logs. Um, I resolved the DOI through doi.org uh, from an on-campus IP that's part of our uh, authentication range with each of those publishers. I captured a complete archive of the page, including the first and third party assets and all code and scripts that come along with it. Um, I read the source code to the best of my ability. I will note that one platform that I looked at at random uh, shipped over 60,000 lines of JavaScript to the browser. Um, so that's why I say to the best of my ability. And then I analyzed the live page with Ghostery. Um, you may have heard of Ghostery before. It's a very uh, handy web browser. There are others like it, sorry, web extension, rather browser extension. There are others like it, but what it does is allow you to block uh, known web trackers. Um, and so here's a, a screenshot of Ghostery running on the website that my team maintains, just to show you that my hands aren't entirely clean. Um, Ghostery finds these third-party assets and blocks them if you, want, if you want it to. I set Ghostery to not block anything, but instead just to use its sort of user-friendly display of the third-party um, code on the page. This is, I, I want to emphasize how simple <laughs> this research was. This is well within the grasp of any library staff member. Um, 
Here's what I found. I found that on average, each of the 15 platforms had 18 third-party assets being loaded on their article page. The median was 10. There was one that had none. If there's anyone here from Inform Pubs Online, kudos um, on having no trackers on your platform. One had over 100. Um, and I found a total of 139 distinct third-party uh, asset sources across these 15 platforms. What is the significance of, of third-party code? Why do I care about it? Why am I looking for it? Um, JavaScript that is loaded onto a web page can access the following things, the page address, the page contents, user actions on the page, browser info, the user IP address, um, contents of existing browser cookies, I'll get into that. JavaScript can also load, Java, load additional JavaScript from other sources. Um, when you're talking about the page address, the page contents, user actions on the page, in the context of a scholarly article, uh, this reads to me as, in, in sort of ALA Patron Bill of Rights parlance, as information being sought, or uh, this is uh, one half of what we try very hard to protect. User behavior, um, user interest, user research, um, we try to protect that when it is combined with user identity information. Um, so under our fairly common understanding, at least it's true at my institution, of what constitutes personally identifiable information, this isn't a big deal. We don't consider IP addresses to be personally identifiable. Um, I think there's argument for reconsidering that, but um, by loading third-party JavaScript, publisher platforms are effectively sharing the content of user research inquiries with third parties, along with information that can and I uh, would say will, be used to specifically identify the user, to bring those two things together that makes us something that we uh, typically would try to protect. So how, how does this work? Um, take the example of Facebook. Four of the 15 platforms included Facebook code on their page. Um, and so on sites with Facebook code on the page, we can assume that the identity of users with a Facebook cookie in their browser. That means if you use the remember me on this computer or save my login function, um, that when users with a live Facebook cookie in their browser visit a publisher page that has Facebook code loaded on it, their visit to that page is going to be stored and attributed to their Facebook identity. Um, you may have recall in a couple of months ago in the news, uh, Mark Zuckerberg testifying on Capitol Hill about, and there were questions about shadow profiling um, as a, um, a practice that Facebook is doing. This is um, creating profiles for people who do not have Facebook accounts based on information from other sources. Um, <clears throat> and because of some of the information that came out around that hearing, we can assume that on sites with Facebook code, users without a Facebook cookie in their, in their browser, um, that the information about the page that they are visiting is likely being combined with a shadow profile or being used to create a shadow profile um, behind the scenes. Google, 14 of the 15 publisher platforms included Google code. Um, likewise here, we can assume that on sites with Google code, um, the identity of users, if you have a live Google cookie in your browser, your identity is going to be combined with the information about the page that you're visiting and stored by Google. And um, I'm trying very hard to keep this as factual as possible and to point out when I'm editorializing or making assumptions. Here's an assumption that I'm making. I assume that the same holds true for users without a Google cookie. Um, how does that happen? How does, how does a shadow profile get created and how do you get information about your identity stored even when you don't have an account or a live login with one of these third parties? One way is through browser fingerprinting. Um, this may be a technique that you are uh, familiar with, but if not, um, I'll just mention that it's a way to generate a unique identifier for a user when you don't know their login information, you d they don't have an account with you, um, and it takes metadata from your web browser that is sent by default to the web server and effectively creates a hash of it, Some, you know, especially if you work in digital preservation, you may know about um, cryptographic hashes as a way to uniquely identify digital items. Um, and that's what's going on here. So it's taking what looks like very benign information, and when it's combined together, 
it becomes remarkably identifying. So as an example, um, this is a screenshot of my visit with the browser that I use most frequently to the uh, EFF Panopticlick site, um, where it showed that of the visitors to their page in the, in the past 45 days, my browser matched only one in over 100,000 browsers. Um, it's, my browser is fairly unique. I'm not doing anything too interesting um, to, to make it so, but um, I will point out, I'm gonna go back here, I will point out that if you do things like enable do not track or install privacy protecting plugins to your browser, it just makes your browser more unique and makes you um, easier to track, unfortunately. Um, browser fingerprinting and this kind of shadow profiling are not just the province of major social networks and ad networks. Um, there's a, a class of tools, I'll refer to them as audience tools, you may have hear them referred to as uh, data management platforms or digital marketing platforms. Um, and in fact, the, the title of our session comes from a promotional video from one of these tools where they talk about how they, you know, collecting, correlating, stitching, enriching, it's about how they combine these tiny bits of data um, and metadata with other data sources with the express purpose of deriving user identity. Um, I don't expect you to read this, it's just, this is just an illustration. Um, so uh, here's a company called Newstar, um, <clears throat> and a, a couple of, of things from this page. Um, <clears throat> In today's connected world where consumers move rapidly across devices and touch points, it's time to stop guessing and start knowing with accurate and verified customer identity data. Over 150 million households compiled, verified, and enhanced with 450 plus fields of demographic, behavioral, financial, property, segmentation, and geographic assets. At least four of the 15 platform, publisher platform pages included Newstar code. Um, Newstar uh, claims that their uh, one ID system, their profiles for users um, are re-corroborated every 15 minutes and that they collect 11 billion points of data um, every day. So that's one of these audience tools or data management platforms. This is a screenshot from a marketing video for another tool called Adobe Audience Manager. You'll, you'll just note that um, this shows a screenshot of their demographic screen with age and income level. Um, also, uh, spaces here for gender, purchases, social, um, at least six of the 15 publisher platforms included Adobe Audience Manager code. Uh, Adobe claims that Audience Manager can turn fragmented data from any channel or device into meaningful audiences that you can act on right away. Um, <clears throat> can be used to deliver offers only to users when they are logged in or based on previous login activity. So when someone is not logged into your platform, you still know who they are. Um, and they advertise their ability to enrich the data that you collect with uh, data uh, purchased from other brokers such as Axiom, which has comprehensive consumer data on approximately 250 million US addressable consumers. Um, that's pretty much everybody. Uh, the third of these audience tools or digital marketing platforms that I'll mention is Oracle Marketing Cloud. Four of the 15 publisher platforms included Oracle Marketing Cloud code. Um, like these others, they are very proud of their ability to connect a user across devices and across sessions. Um, they claim that their Oracle ID graph can reach over 90% of the people online in the US. Um, and where do these data management platforms get the information that they use to build these data sets? The metadata, the browser fingerprints, things like that. Um, well, at least some of it comes from our patrons' use of library resources. Um, 11 of the 15 publisher platforms included a tool called Add This. Add This is a script that gathers information about the user and their activity and shares it with a network of over 40 different advertisers and data brokers, including Newstar, Adobe, Oracle, and Google. So publisher platforms send data to these data brokers who then use it to help publishers and ad networks to better identify and target users on publisher platforms. I've now mentioned six of the 139 different um, sources of third-party code that I found on these 15 platforms. 
any of these 139 tools is technically capable to similarly surveil users, and we have to assume that many are. Um, so this is the complete list of the add this partners as of February, um, uh, highlighting the, the ones that I've, I've previously talked about. I'll note that as of yesterday, uh, New Star's site featured a story about uh, Aetna's successful use of their technology. Um, and I'll note here that the top 100 articles that I started with at the beginning of this study included topics like childhood obesity and cancer treatment. Um, and I don't expect that our users anticipate that their research on health topics will ultimately be used to create a profile on them that will be shared with their insurance company. Likewise, um, do, our, do our users expect their research behavior to be shared with eBay and combined with their bidding activity? Um, Samsung is a partner here. Um, do they expect their research behavior to be shared with the manufacturer of their television for the purpose of better showing them ads on the television home screen? There's at least one publisher platform that directly included Samsung um, advertising code on their page. Or at least one platform included code from LinkedIn. Do our users expect that their research behavior is going to be used to help target advertisements to them in their career networking site? So I do not believe that it is possible for use of licensed resources to be private. Um, the tiny bits of information that are uh, being sent to dozens of third-party platforms every time our users access an article will be used to identify them. Our idea of personally identifiable information has been totally outstripped by Moore's Law and cheap storage, so that now we have to assume that every tiny bit of information that can be collected about a user will be collected about a user and will sit latent until it can be, until enough information can be aggregated around it that that user can be personally identified. So I am really heartened to see some recent sort of institutional attention being given to this new privacy landscape. Um, ALA Patron Bill of Rights Article 7 was approved at midwinter. Um, this reads as pretty aspirational to me, um, given what I've looked at here, uh, because I think it's fairly safe to say that we are not presently protecting privacy and safeguarding user data, library use data, rather. Likewise, the Stanford statement that, uh, that David referenced earlier, this is an excellent statement, it is powerful. What I don't know is, that if, is if it's true, at least in the sense of a present tense of reject because unless the code that's being shipped to the signatories of this letter, which it's possible it could be, um, but unless the code that's being shipped to users from their libraries is substantially different from what's being shipped to University of Minnesota libraries patrons, um, they are not, uh, uh, they, they are in fact silently exposing user data to third party interests. Um, I suspect that, you know, this, this uh, statement was intended to apply primarily to things like the Safari Books Online, to single sign-on, things like that, but um, it's broadly stated. Um, I'm going to go back here for just a second and just say, I am concerned when we tout our commitment to privacy and our values around privacy that we don't give our users a false sense of what the actual privacy landscape is. And I believe that we are in that position currently. Um, so there is some effort underway to build model license language around some of these concerns. So again, at um, uh, Lisa Janicki Hinchliff and Katie Zimmerman at uh, the December meeting talked a little bit about an, a nascent effort there that I'm really excited about. Um, I would finally just encourage all of you here, all of you listening at home in the future on the video, um, this is very easy to do. Um, and I think it will reveal a lot about the current landscape of your electronic resources. I would encourage you to take a look at it yourself. Um, and with that, uh, here's a link to the longer write-up, contact information. I will be around um, the rest of today and tomorrow. Happy to talk about this with anyone. And we've got time for questions. What time is it? 3.06. Yeah, sure. All right. Thank <laughs> you.